Hi. Good morning from Singapore and to our friends tuning in from India. Thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about advanced manufacturing and robotics, fostering game-changing innovations for regional collaboration. My name is Wei Min from SG Novit. We are a government-owned organization in Singapore who believes in positive impact of deep tech to benefit humanity. A good part of our work also involves building a community of scientists, commercializing research, building deep tech talents, as well as working with our ecosystem partners in scaling deep tech for improving the lives of many around the world. And that is why we have formed this community where our work in investing in startups, corporate collaborations, and promoting knowledge sharing enable us to scale and build deep techs around. Today, we are very happy to partner with the Federation of India Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FICCI for short, to present to you this webinar on advanced manufacturing and robotics. In recent years, Singapore has been active in exploring opportunities with India in areas such as trade facilitation, commerce, and customs, which also bring us here today, where it is through these events, we bring about opportunities where we connect people from all areas, such as startups, researchers, and corporates, involving them in an exchange where we explore and deep dive into the topic of game-changing innovations for regional collaborations. To kickstart this session, allow me to invite Mr. Dilip Chenoy, Secretary General of the SICCI, who also has vast experience in areas of engineering and advanced manufacturing. For some of his past appointments include being the Director General of Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers, Manufacturers and Chairman of San Longoa Institute of Engineering and Technology. Just to name a few. All right, um, with no further ado, please do allow me to pass the time to Mr. Dilip Chenoy. Mr. Dilip, please. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Raymond for that uh, introduction. Um, Good morning, and I just want to begin by hoping that everybody, wherever in the world you are, whether in Singapore or India or elsewhere, that you are all safe and well, and your families are safe. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be cooperating with SG Innovate on this uh, seminar, on webinar, actually, on advanced manufacturing and robotics, game-changing innovations for regional collaboration. Uh, I'd like to extend a very warm and cheerful welcome to everyone who's joined the webinar. Uh, also pleased to extend my thanks and greetings to extreme panelists, Ms. Professor Lakshmidhar Behera, Chair, Professor Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, IIT Kanpur, and Mr. Ajay Gopal Swami, Chief Executive Officer and Director, uh, De facto Robotics and Automation Private Limited, Mr. Rohit Giridhar, Vice President Infineon Technologies, uh, Ms. Akansha Jagwani, co-founder and CEO of Sixth Sense, and Mr. Jagnesh Shinardhan, Senior Director of Frost & Sullivan Asia Pacific, who's going to be your moderator for this session. Actually, the world you know, will, uh, is currently going through uh, a, a kind of a phase-defining change. So there was the world uh, free uh, COVID, where a lot of uh, research, collaboration, um, you know, startups and all were focusing on solving problems uh, in uh, different actual scenarios. But during COVID, almost entirely, whether it be research organizations, whether it be startups, or whether it be the corporate sector, whether it be government, everybody pivoted their attention to actually look at manufacturing products or identifying and solving products to solve the tremendous amount of challenges that were put forth in uh, COVID. Even in the manufacturing sector, you know, I mean, you had alcohol companies making sanitizers. You had auto component companies making ventilators. You had textile companies making PPEs. They all had to re rejig their whole, you know, manufacturing set up to actually product, uh, train their people and use their production lines to produce new products. And what is very interesting, they had to do it with fewer people. So you had a lot of uh, uh, you know, initiatives coming up there in terms of automating and social distancing actually made you come up with new innovations. So how do you ensure that people in assembly line keep social distance rather than spreading them about, uh, out, you create a uh, plastic barrier or you create some barrier in between. So the whole, uh, you know, the whole issue actually was looked at from a solutions uh, standpoint. And now going forward, uh, people are saying if we could get together and, you know, collaborate, 
whether it is collaborate in getting technologies from one country and manufacturing them in another, whether it is collaborating uh, on the production of a vaccine or production of testing kits, the whole COVID scenario has actually fostered and created an ecosystem for much more powerful regional cooperation, much more cooperation among corporates. And it is actually underlying the theme of innovation. And therefore, this, uh, uh, this conference and this webinar today is very, very significant in that background. Also, if you look at the use of artificial intelligence or digital uh, technologies uh, across different uh, spheres of industry and society, whether it be in simple tracking, tracing uh, of, of people who have been, uh, who, are, who could be potential carriers who have been exposed uh, to uh, you know, the uh, virus. It's another area of innovation there. Uh, and going forward, you know, post COVID, I think this will get accelerated. The adoption of technologies and advancements in software, hardware, automation, robotics will open a lot of opportunities for ASEAN countries to cooperate. Uh, people are looking at, uh, you know, a second uh, aspect or a hub for the global value chain. So that again uh, opens up a huge area for uh, for collaboration. Even then, if I look at the skills ecosystem and the people's ecosystem, you would require to train and retrain people. And this is another area for cooperation. Regional cooperation is going to be the cornerstone of, uh, of the whole development scenario going forward. And I think this is going to ensure that companies, corporates, governments, and everybody uh, actually look uh, to adjust through collaborating and adopting new forms of innovation uh, processes and ecosystems and advanced manufacturing technologies uh, to adjust to the emerging, uh, emerging new normal. I believe that we have a great panel here. Uh, I am not the expert in this. The experts are the panelists. And uh, you know, I'm sure that all the participants are looking forward to, uh, to listen uh, to them. And I would, at this point of time, once again, extend a very warm welcome and thank SG Innovate and the entire team for collaborating on this and entire team at FIKI, including our uh, Navita and our team uh, ET in India on, on, on collaborating on this and hand over the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, to the session to the moderator, Mr. Janesh Janardhan, Senior Director of Frost and Sullivan, Asia Pacific, Singapore. Uh, have a good day and stay safe. Thank you so much, Dilip. And good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for joining this session. Today we are discussing advanced manufacturing and robotics. I'm Janesh, senior director with Frost and Sullivan in Singapore. Prior to starting my consulting career with Frost 10 years ago, I was the founder and CEO of a robotics firm. We started in the National University of Singapore in 2004 and later moved our headquarters to Bangalore in India in 2007 when we received our first significant amount of funding and our first main customer. Today, after 10 years in consulting, I manage aerospace transportation and logistics for Frost and Sullivan in Asia Pacific, and we regularly advise clients on the use of robotics technologies in these sectors. We work with large companies in robotics, industrial robotics, logistics, etc., and help them with their growth strategy and pipeline. Today, industrial manufacturing or manufacturing at scale has come a long way. From water and steam powered machines to the sweeping changes that came about with the use of electricity to the changes again with the adoption of electronics and computing in manufacturing. Today, we are witnessing our manufacturing sector take yet another leap. High levels of sensorization, IoT, information sharing between systems, high levels of collaboration. We are seeing new use cases, additive manufacturing, AI, collaborative robotics, etc. We are even thinking of dark factories or lights out factories that would run all by themselves with no human intervention. Today, robotics globally is a $90 billion, uh, uh, $90 billion a year industry, and just the manufacturing segment is a $40 billion industry. Price of major robotics companies are also falling. So on hardware, motors, cameras, the price is falling and the specs are getting better. And same is happening for computing power. This is enabling us to do more with computer vision, speech recognition, situational awareness of robotics, navigation technologies, etc. Robots are becoming more useful and more accessible than ever before. 
in times of covid 19 also we are seeing businesses focus a lot on business continuity how to reduce factory downtime how to do more near shoring how to diversify manufacturing locations and once again there is more focus on robotics and automation today we have four experts with us first is prof lakshmidhar behra who is the chair professor robotics and artificial intelligence at indian institute of technology kanpur in india he works closely with companies like tata wipro adnoc abu dhabi etc <clears throat> on robotics technologies last year he also incubated a startup iswati and they have initiated collaboration with companies in singapore like rolls royce on ai and robotics next we have rohit girdar he is a vice president strategy and market development for infineon technologies he is based in singapore but he is also the board member for infineon in india the focus of infineon is on robotics application area they provide components for industrial automation service robots home automation etc but they also focus on implementation of robotics in industry 4.0 in infineon's own facilities we have akanksha jagwani who is the ceo and co-founder of six sense a deep tech startup uh, based in singapore she was a mechanical engineer and has worked in the automotive and aerospace uh, sector in the past and today she caters mostly to the semiconductor industry we also have ajay gopal sami who is the ceo de facto robotics and automation headquartered in bangalore india he works closely with major automotive oems as well as other companies in pharma and industry i want to welcome all my panelists to the session let me get into the thick of the discussion by picking up from where mr dilip left off which is we are going through a very interesting time this is this happens once in maybe 100 200 years covid 19 has resulted in so much disruption in the way we typically do stuff we have seen a lot of new economies come out of it there is a work from home economy which is something that businesses are trying to cater to governments are trying to keep supply chains open so people can still get their goods on time so i want to ask professor lakshmidhar how do you see the impact of covid 19 on manufacturing supply chains etc and prof you are on mute at the moment danesh thank you thank you for asking this question i did little <clears throat> search uh, the impact of covid on indian manufacturing as such in indian industrial scenario so i saw that major companies in india such as larsen and trubro bharat forge ultra tech cement grasm industry the fashion and retail wing of aditya birla group tata motors thermax temporarily suspended or significantly reduced operations in number of manufacturing facilities and factories across the country as i was telling all of you i was part of the smart machine group in tcs and the office which is situated in noida was closed since 17th march and we are all working from home as you rightly said nearly all two wheelers and four wheelers companies put a stop to production till further notice so basically it's kind of uh, uh, but interestingly there are like you know i know about tata uh, they started working on different uh, robotics products for covid although the factories were closed but the government of, government of india allowed people to do work on covid related development so that is one of the interesting scenario that we saw and if you look at uh, in the second week of may companies started preparation for restarting the operation some companies have opened offices with maximum permitted strength of 33% while others took a more cautious approach as low as 5% a study by lra securities inc found that five indian states kerala punjab tamil nadu haryana and karnataka are contributing 27% to india's gdp as india emerges from total lockdown now if you look at uh, the government initiative a mobile manufacturing incentives were offered by the government to mobile manufacturers in the beginning of june 2020 uh, this year uh, and this include around 50000 crore us 7 billion dollar um, has been uh, invested directly by the government of india 
So this is uh, uh, linked to mobile uh, 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 manufacturing, mobile app, mobile uh, you know phones. So this uh, this is what I would say the overall scenario. Uh, things completely went uh, almost like closed down and slowly, slowly coming up. And there is a prediction that some are saying it is a V-shaped recovery of the economy. Some are saying W-shaped recovery of the economy. We don't know. But personally, I would look at, we have to wait until December, how COVID situation is panning across the world and whether it is flattening or coming again, so it will do. But the world has changed certainly because of COVID. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prof. Lakshmi. There are some interesting points to note there in terms of some industries being perhaps impacted more than other industries. I know for a fact that the automotive sector is very badly impacted. People are not uh, going to dealerships anymore to check out cars or buying cars. At least the volumes have reduced significantly also contributed by social distancing. But there is also another argument that maybe automotive will see a slightly quicker uh, recoveries uh, compared to some of the other sectors because people would have a preference for um, uh, their own cars and to be in a safe uh, kind of a personal space as they move about. Again, we will have to wait for uh, some significant healthcare intervention to see this go away completely. But in the meantime, uh, we can see how the governments are stepping in to provide incentives and try to facilitate uh, different kinds of activities during this time. I want to extend the same question to Rohit. Rohit, you have views on what is happening in Singapore and also potentially in India across different sectors. How do you see COVID-19 uh, impacting manufacturing? Okay, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so I come from the semiconductor and solutions uh, industry. So I'll speak to that a uh, little bit. Um, we think that, uh, you know, while the last 20 years were um, uh, a kind of a period of uh, distributed supply chains, uh, what has been sort of been the trend in the last few months, especially in the aftermath of COVID, uh, is that uh, there have been sort of tendencies around increased uh, uh, kind of localized manufacturing or nationalistic uh, kind of trends around manufacturing. So there are uh, sort of, um, I would say, early announcements from a lot of companies uh, about, uh, you know, looking at um, diversification of supply chains in the electronics and semiconductor um, industry. Uh, it's too early yet. Uh, as you know, most of um, the activities have still not reached um, kind of the normal level. Uh, but there are um, kind of announcements of, uh, for example, um, uh, potential relocations of plants or setup of, you know, additional capacities um, uh, in, in different geographies and so on. Uh, so I think that would be possibly um, a trend which we may see accelerate. Um, I think the, the second thing I want to, uh, you know, specifically talking about Singapore. So Singapore is actually our lighthouse uh, in terms of uh, back-end manufacturing because we have our smart factory uh, for, um, you know, for where we do all the worldwide tests for microcontrollers, right? And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly automated setup, which we've been working on, let's say, for the last eight years or so, uh, with very close collaboration, obviously, of uh, various government bodies, EDB, uh, MOM, MTI, and so on, right? Uh, so I think during this crisis, uh, you know, sort of the very close partnership uh, and uh, very, very close relationship and really um, very, very proactive behavior by the government agencies have enabled us to, uh, to you know, keep our factories up and running. So I think that, that is a clear differentiator, right? And here I think Singapore has done a very good job uh, in this regard. Um, and then now coming to India, um, yeah, for our industry, I would also like to mention that um, a very, very interesting policy around electronics and semiconductor manufacturing um, recently announced a few weeks ago, uh, I think for further details, you can actually refer to the Ministry of Electronics uh, and Information Technology website. Uh, some of them are called PLI, SPECS, and so on and so forth. And this um, kind of follows the call of, the, uh, of uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, about, um, you know, Atman Nirbharta or being self-reliant, right? 
So obviously, we see a strong desire also in India to build up a very vibrant uh, manufacturing ecosystem around electronics and uh, and components, right? So I think a lot of things are in are in motion. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, both in Singapore and India, but uh, you know, we'll see in the coming months. So uh, how this evolves, uh, and then to further to the professor's point, yes, at this point, um, all of us are hoping for obviously a V-shaped recovery. But how quickly that will be? Will there be a second wave or not? So there are a lot of variables on the on the virus itself because this is not a normal recession. It depends on the the spread of the virus and that impacts then you know how quickly people can get back to work. Uh, so a a lot of things also depend on that. Right? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rohit. Um, maybe I can extend this question a little bit further. Twenty years ago, robotics was mostly used in, let's say, automotive factories, semiconductors, maybe some pharma laboratories. What would be your sense on the current level of penetration of robotics? Is it still usually seen in high precision, high value, high volume kind of areas, or do you see this change? And maybe I can start with Ajay on this. Yeah. Thank you, Janesh. Thanks for uh, having me on the panel. So, um, like you mentioned earlier, you know the the cost of components of robots are dropping. The computing power is you know increasing exponentially. So all these are uh, factors which are uh, you know increasing the application space of robots. So when looking at industrial robots, you know you are right that robots were initially used. Have been used. They continue to be used in the automotive area. There were still some areas within the automotive manufacturing space which were not robotized. For example, the final assembly, you know, fixing the glass on the car body, fixing the rubber feet, because these are all highly dexterous operations, and uh, robots did not have the capacity yet, uh, uh, earlier to do all those kind of intricate tasks. But now things have uh, changed. The technologies have improved. Things like cobots, where uh, humans and collaborative robots uh, working together, uh, where the cobots take over some of the more mundane and um, intricate tasks, and the human being guides the robot. So these technologies, along with machine vision developments in machine vision, which I'm sure Akansha will talk about later, and mobile robotics, these are all expanding the space into which robots are being deployed. So in in automotive. We are seeing that, of course. So, even areas which are not traditionally operations, which are not traditionally uh, automated, like inspection, is also now being uh, automated. And moving out from uh, automotive, the general industry is also, you know, looking at automating in a very big way. We are seeing that a lot, even in India, where you know labor cost is low, but there are many operations like the foundry industry, which is dangerous, dusty. Uh, people don't like to work there, so um, those are the areas which are seeing a huge uh, increase in automation levels. Uh, then uh, the food industry, packaging, these are being automated, um, and in the general, in the energy sector, solar manufacturing, wind turbine manufacturing, electric motors and generators, we are seeing a lot of activity there. So you are right that uh, you know. Um, the automation is moving out, spreading out into uh, overall manufacturing ecosystem, and it's no longer uncommon to see a very small um, two, five, six employee company having a few machine tools. You now, talking about, uh, hey, I want to uh, start automating my operation. So that's becoming, uh, you know, we are seeing that. So that's uh, it's. Uh, that that trend is only going to accelerate going forward. So the level of awareness of these technologies, the benefits of them are well understood as well as they are much more accessible now. Yeah. For widespread yeah. deployment. Maybe I can ask the same question to Akansha. Akansha, you worked in the automotive industry, you worked in the aerospace industry, and now you're heading a deep tech startup. What are your views on this? Do you see a very high level of uh, penetration of these technologies now in the industry? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me on board and uh, for Janesh and Ajay sharing your views on the topic. 
uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, as Ajay mentioned, uh, about the need has been assessed and has been realized in the other industries as well. And even if when I talk about semiconductors, there are two portions to it, the front end and back end. And uh, the adoption of technology has been uh, well versed in the front end so far. And now it is moving towards back end where packaging happens, the OSATs that are manufacturing. So we are seeing a trend of adoption there. And uh, having uh, spoken to people uh, in addition to the industries which I have worked with, also I got to learn about uh, industries like oil and gas, where there is a lot of remote uh, requirement and assessment of bots. Um, there has been a clear trend of adoption, and that is becoming multifold with the current COVID situation that they are trying to adopt. So uh, industries who have assessed the need so far are becoming more proactively aware right now of uh, adopting it. Uh, but industries who hadn't tested it so far, um, I think um, industries in the uh, areas of um, mining, wherein it has been uh, not been thought so far, it is quite a bit difficult right now to think about it. But I'm sure the benefits that Ajay mentioned in terms of it being more affordable and feasible right now uh, is taking the trend to go further. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective, Vakansha. Let me focus this on the two countries that we are talking about. So we have India, which is a huge market for 1.3 billion people, one of the youngest and largest population of STEM talent anywhere in the world. And now the government is also trying to introduce a lot of new initiatives. Uh, maybe one of the more prominent one is the Make in India initiative with a big focus on re-energizing the manufacturing sector. <laughs> question is for both uh, Prof. Lakshmidhar and Ajay. How do you see robotics adoption increasing in India, maybe over the last five, ten years, towards this mission of making India into a manufacturing powerhouse? Uh, and related to that question is, who are some of the key companies that you see catering to this, uh, and what kind of success are they seeing in India? Let's start with Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, uh, for that question. It's a very wonderful question, actually. Uh, actually, when uh, this COVID started, uh, the TCS group and I had a, we have a, a many brainstorming session where we are going now. See, some of the things that is really getting impacted is health sector, the safety of the health worker. So robots going to play a big role in the health sector. Similarly, the factories have to be run from the home. So can you build the you know, telepresence uh, robot, including telepresence drone, to enable our factory and keep the factory running? You also have to see that I want to divert a little bit because this is something because I am a researcher and I have been looking at how robots can now go and live among us. Right, how low robot can uh, you know empower individually? So this is just like you know this smartphone. Now this became a very big soft tool for every individual. You know, so similarly, I look at the robot. What I say, this is a human robot collaboration. A human, if he knows how to work with a robot through voice interface, through intention interface, through guesser interface, through even easy interface, like elderly health care. So if we can build such robots, you know, they will have application in agriculture, they will have application in keeping our water clean, air clean. You know, there is myriads of uh, possibilities I look at. So we have to now bring robot from the caged situation in a big way to the individual application where people can, can keep a robot in their own house and still can do a lot of work while, and you see that when robot is completely automated, it is very costly because robot has to understand everything. Whereas in a human collaborated robot, it will have less cost. Only thing is that we must now develop the app by which a human being can interact with the robot and they understand each other. The one of the aspect or strong point of India is uh, that we are very good at software. You know, recently through my company, 
I'm trying to sign a MOU with a Bangalore company where they are going to give us the hardware and we want to put our software. So this, this is something, you see, even if in India, we don't have an ecosystem to create a precise uh, machine or a precise robot because that is very costly. But using AI, we can make our machine very uh, less costly while effective. So this is something that we have to look at. So this is your first question. Do you want me to also the answer the second question? Yes, please. Yes, please. So as per second question, you see that gray orange is doing very well. They are in warehouse automation. We have some other robots like Team Indus, uh, and there's a Bangalore. Gray orange is from Gurga. Pari Robotics from Pune. Systematics, this is my good friend Raju. He has been working in Bangalore for a long time. Planis. But as of now, there are like a Noka Robotics, Bionic, Yantra. So all these are there. And uh, Lockheed Batin has come forward and has tied up with uh, Tata to, uh, to start uh, a manufacturing or back in India. But still the big players are Kuka, Fanuk, and ABB. These are still big players. But I really see that this, instead of building this, you know, of course, this, uh, uh, this big end uh, robot as high end robotics that are normally used in automotive sector and, uh, and uh, in the manufacturing sector, we need to go to the robot that would empower a, like, you know, you see the coconut, uh, you have to plow coconut from the coconut plant or arachnid from the arachnid plant. You don't have a people now because there are a category of people they used to do this job. Those generations are gone. We need a person who can use either a drone or a mobile manipulator or something and with a proper collaboration, they can get it. So this is my some of the inputs as far as your questions are concerned. Thank you, Prof. I have so many comments and questions on some of those, but I need to watch the time. But one of the large companies that you forgot to mention, I think, was de facto robotics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go Thank to uh, let's go to uh, Ajay. Ajay, how do you see this uh, happening in India right now? What What do you see as the um, level of adoption? Uh, do you see an increased push from the various initiatives like Make in India? Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, Janesh. I mean. Uh, just to talk about the manufacturing space, if I'm, I'm, I, because our company focuses on the manufacturing space. So if we talk only about the manufacturing space, I have a you know, few interesting statistics. So um, the one of the statistics which is measured, and all the statistics that I quote are from this uh, website called ifr.org, International Federation of Robotics. So they collect data from all the uh, manufacturing countries around the world and they track the usage of uh, robots, both industrial and service, but I'm going to talk about only industrial robots. So the largest market for industrial robots is of course China. I mean, they sold or uh, they deployed about 154,000 robots uh, last year or in 2018 rather. The other interesting uh, statistic which is quoted by IFR is the robot density which is the number of robots deployed per 10,000 workers, okay? And interestingly, the number one country in that is Singapore, okay? They have a robot density of 831 robots per 10,000 workers. This was as per the IFR website of 2018. It's available on the internet, IFR, International Federation of Robotics, .org, okay? So, they, um, the world average is about 100 robots per uh, 10,000 workers. Singapore is number one at 831. Korea is at about 774. Uh, China, which was in the low 20s and 30s till recently, has gone up to 140. India is at four, four units per 10,000 workers. So there's, in, in terms of industrial robotization, we still have a long way to catch up. But the other interesting statistic which they put up was that India had the highest growth rate of industrial robots deployment. So it jumped up by almost 39% in 2018 over 2017. These are the latest statistics that are available. 
and of course we all expect that it will this would drop because of the present covid situation but as you can see singapore has the highest robot density in the world and india has a long way to catch up but the good thing is the uh, the usage is increasing very rapidly because i and as i mentioned earlier you know there are so many industries now who are uh, automating so this will definitely go up you know, and number of uh, uh, robot companies coming into india number of uh, robotics companies that uh, professor vera mentioned about uh, is increasing and uh, we are also growing uh, the de facto i mean so uh, you, you mentioned uh, about systematics uh, dr jaggi is a very close friend of mine and i can actually see his company outside my window <laughs> so uh, so we there there are a lot of very innovative companies in india who are developing um, technologies related to industrial robots as well as service robotics i i know many you know bangalore based startups doing work in drones and de facto is also now starting to look at mobile robots because we think that that is the next big thing to happen within manufacturing industries you know uh, we have all these arms which do the actual assembly and welding and all that but then the parts that need to come into the robotic lines are still brought in with uh, you know forklift trucks and um, you know pallet trucks and all that and that's that's common even in the uh, abroad so those kind of operations the logistic operations within a manufacturing setup is still to be automated and we think there is a huge uh, potential there okay so um yeah i hope that answers uh, the question janesh absolutely ajay and you brought up some very interesting uh, points as well like asia pacific initially had the benefit of a lower cost base and that is how it became the center of manufacturing for the world but increasingly what you're seeing is that countries like china uh, their wages now are no longer uh, the cheapest in the world which basically means that they need to see a very high level of automation and increased productivity per employee uh, and that is one of the key forces that is driving the increased adoption asia pacific that for that reason is one of the largest um, markets for robotics technologies in the world and you're absolutely right uh, india a lot of them are starting to see india as a credible alternative location for manufacturing uh, distribution uh, in the sense that you can't have centralized one location global manufacturing anymore especially situations like covid-19 has exposed that vulnerability you need to have multiple locations so you are starting to see manufacturing relocations to thailand vietnam uh, potentially india as well and uh, you would start to see more adoption of very advanced technologies that you see around the world happening more and more let's contrast this to singapore now singapore has a much smaller footprint to stay ahead efficiency is the name of the game and for the singapore government proactively looks at areas of improvement and they try to enable the industry i want to take the perspectives of rohit and akanksha how do you see singapore from the adoption of robotics technology we heard some good statistics from uh, ajay but in your own experience how do you see robotics adoption happening in singapore okay. Should I maybe I go first? Uh, yes, uh, Kangsha. Yeah. So um, yeah, thank you. So um, basically, we look at um, kind of four major areas. Um, if you, tell, I mean, robotics itself is pretty broad. So I think you need to uh, distinguish into four areas. Uh, the first is your classical um, industrial automation and uh, warehousing and factory automation kind of application, right? so that we have discussed uh, a lot which industries will adopt that first and so on and here singapore um yeah as was rightly pointed out by one of the panelists is the density is very high the second and i think the more interesting areas uh, is for example uh, service robots so uh, you are beginning to see some interesting applications in healthcare in hospitals uh, in hotels for delivery and so on and so forth right um the third uh, and also another promising area is um, smart home robots so what actually started off uh, as robotic vacuum cleaners you know uh, several years ago has now sort of turned into a very very interesting niche of the market uh, you now have you know for example robotic lawn mowers uh, you have uh, a, a lot of applications centered around the home right and the last area is what i would call uh, autonomous mobility 
So that sort of covers um, robot cars, which we haven't talked about so far. Uh, but um, with where also Singapore, by the way, has been running some very, very interesting pilots um, uh, around, uh, you know, autonomous driving and uh, drones. So, so these are broadly the four areas that we as Infineon look at and, um, and uh, basically our components, uh, which do the three things which any robotic application needs to do. Uh, first is the eyes and ears, so you need to sense. We offer sensors. Second is you need to compute, so the brain of the robot, uh, so microcontrollers and, the, and so on. And the third is then actuate, so the motion which then happens after the computation and sensing. And this, is, uh, this comes from our, our power devices, which we call them, you know, which provide the muscle uh, for the robots because these do motion control and motor control and all of that, right? So from our perspective, we see four areas. What started off as very, very strong um, only on the industrial side now also you see very interesting activity on the other three areas which I mentioned earlier. And I think Singapore is um, really at the forefront and a lot of startups um, and also established companies are trying in also these new uh, areas um, as well, right? We've, we've had a very, we have some very promising startups uh, which you know became unicorns and so on. Uh, and, and you will see more of this, right? So you will see uh, not just the density uh, which was mentioned by one of the panelists, but also these newer applications. And uh, I think Singapore with its emphasis on digitalization and a stronger emphasis now uh, after post COVID, you can see a lot more of this in our opinion. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you, Rohit. And it's, uh, it's a good point. It's not just about manufacturing. You start to see Singapore, even during COVID-19, how the, the press uh, that has been coming out talks a lot about robotics application in healthcare service delivery to be able to service uh, quarantine patients uh, using mobile robotics uh, solutions as Prof also mentioned. Akanksha, uh, you're a startup based in Singapore. You're focusing on AI, deep tech. How do you see the space in Singapore? Hey, uh, thank you, Rohit, for adding on the robotics layer. Maybe what I can do is add on the intelligent software layer that goes on top of robotics and uh, share my perspectives on how it has been adopted in Singapore. Uh, so basically, operating in the Singapore market for last two years and having the opportunity to interact with people on the ground, like engineers and managers in the shop floor, and also with the senior management, uh, the overall gut feeling is that they can't wait to adopt AI technology at that application level also. Uh, they see today because of the situation, they see the innate need of operating efficiently via AI as a means. So this is where they see that this has become a central segment of whole operations. And in order for them to utilize machines at their full capacity uh, without having all humans on the shop floor, uh, this is one of the ways of still making it to the margins that they want to make in the market. And to make it happen, they're not only investing uh, money in AI technology, they're also setting up dedicated teams uh, to make these collaborations a successful project. So this is where I see not only uh, investments, uh, but also the collaboration and support that companies here are uh, doing with us. And this has been uh, very influential in the whole ecosystem of Singapore and AI. Are you seeing this mostly in large establishments and companies, or do you also see smaller companies adopting more? So I think uh, my interaction so far with, has been with large companies uh, who have multiple plans and have the bandwidth to dedicate teams to work with us on this. Uh, my interactions with uh, companies which are, I would say, a, a somewhat lower, uh, I would say, in terms of volume of production than these companies, uh, are also very excited and have acknowledged the need and the potential. But when it comes to implementation level decisions, when we say that, okay, let us start the project from tomorrow, then it comes to understanding more on the playbook that do you have a playbook right now? Uh, if we can see that happening somewhere else, then we would be more happy to sign up for that. So this is the uh, difference, but I feel like uh, they would soon catch up as long as they see some applications working. So it's more on awareness and less on implementation for them. Sure. So I want to stick with this point and Prof also mentioned earlier that uh, it's important to bring the robots out of the cage to be able to work alongside robots and stuff like that, to, to alongside humans and stuff like that. So specifically on this issue, there's a lot of manufacturing that happens in SMEs. Now, if, if they are not the main company that is putting together the final product, there is still a lot of SMEs behind them doing smaller pieces and components and stuff like that. So from a manufacturing and SME standpoint, 
how relevant is robotics technologies for SMEs? And let me start with Ajay on this. Um, how do you see SMEs looking at uh, cobot, cobots, collaborative robots? Do you see this as something that is picking up? Uh, actually, yes, Janesh. I mean, we are seeing um, a lot of small scale industries showing a lot of interest in uh, cobots. I know one company in Jamshedpur having a small uh, manufacturing operation. Um, and uh, they, and, I mean, it's, it's on the uh, website, the case studies are on the website of this company, Universal Robots, who are one of the leading, uh, you know, suppliers of uh, collaborative robots. So this company in Jamshedpur um, trained up um, some operators to program the cobots to do a simple machine load and unload operation. Uh, and we are seeing a number of such uh, smaller organizations who uh, we're facing labor shortages, like Professor Vera mentioned, you know, the, uh, the shortage of agricultural workers uh, now and uh, similarly in industry also, like in foundry, nobody wants to work in the foundry, even if you pay them well, they, they just don't want to do it because uh, it's too dangerous, it's not a happy place to work. So um, uh, we are seeing companies talking to us about you know, how do we get started with a low cost uh, automation project? And that's where uh, Cobots is one technology which can uh, help in that. But there are other, um, you know, traditional robots also can be used there. And uh, because as you mentioned, the cost of automation and the hardware is dropping. So a lot of interest from small scale industries and small manufacturers to deploy industrial robots, traditional industrial robots and cobots, even machine vision, the cost of machine vision is so low. The challenges they face is of course, you know, investing one time is all well and nice. They can probably afford that, but then how do they maintain it? So then the question of, you know, training and skill upgradation, that is something that they initially don't realize, but then they quickly come to know that, you know, that's, that's something that they need to invest in, in their manpower, upgrading the skills of the people, um, then the upstream process, downstream process. So it's not just automating one process. It's about you know, the whole ecosystem needs to be um, you know, upgraded. So, uh, but it's very interesting that uh, even small scale industries are you know, very actively looking at automation to, to help them in their manufacturing process and improve their quality, um, reduce costs, overcome their labor issues. Uh, a lot of companies because of this uh, COVID situation and the uh, issue of migrant workers going back to their hometowns. So there's a, suddenly there is a you know, shortage of uh, uh, skilled workers now. So that's making a lot of people realize that you know, they need to at least automate some of their key operations so that you know, they, their so supply doesn't stop to their clients. So. I mean, it's it's it is going to I mean this trend of uh, automation in, even in these small scale manufacturers is just going to increase. So it's a very interesting point that you brought up, Ajay. Uh, and we had some reports that we put out that said that while almost no industry is ready for one hundred percent automation, seventy percent of the industries in the world today are designed in such a way that at least twenty five percent of the tasks that they do can be automated. If you aggregate all of this, basically what is happening with our industry right now is almost 50% of all the jobs today in the world can be automated. Many repetitive, dull, difficult, dangerous jobs. Robotics people will suddenly see this as a 4D of robotics. Um, this translates to almost $8 trillion in human salaries and wages. So my question, and let me start with Akanksha on this is, what are some of the areas that people should be developing skills? Uh, we are going to see a high adoption of robotics technologies. We are going to see a high level of automation. Uh, factors like COVID-19 is only going to accelerate this. For people who are coming out of colleges, getting into jobs, getting into startups, what would be some of the hot areas they should be looking at from an upskilling standpoint? 
you Jinesh. Uh, so I think in terms of where the skills are relying more, I think anybody uh, who is graduating now, even my siblings at home, if they ask me this question, uh, it comes very natural to tell me that computing these days is a basic fundamental like math was in the past. So uh, irrespective of whether you are studying economics or any other domain that you're interested in, make sure that that becomes as a fundamental skill that you acquire, like you're acquiring English right now. So this is where I feel like uh, if you were to, if you have an interest in moving towards technology, uh, thinking about the current technologies that are game changing, uh, I would say from upskilling perspective or even for institutes to be including these as a part of their curriculum. Um, I think fundamentally uh, the topics that we are discussing today in terms of advanced robotics, AR, VR, um, when I was in college um, six years ago, um, machine learning was a new thing. So this is where I think a lot of emphasis was being put to be able to put that up. And now people are reaping the benefits of it. There's a stark difference in terms of employment rate and where people are getting more benefits and advantages of their own skills, uh, spending equal number of hours. So this is where one thing, uh, where I feel a lot of emphasis can be put on in terms of advanced technologies being exposed, um, in terms of understanding how to play around with this and get comfortable on these technologies. Second would be more on the uh, upskilling on more um, communications and managerial skills. So when uh, robotics are going to take care of all the repetitive tasks, there will be still unpredictable and human emotion level a requirement uh, in any industry. It would not be limited to just manufacturing, but in all general. So I feel that is uh, the second area where a lot of emphasis can be put on in terms of learning. Um, like given that everybody's, um, the pie is growing, the, the economy is growing. So there will be a lot of services that will be required uh, as people become more uh, better in terms of uh, making wages, they would also need new services. And this is where the whole service industry will take a boom. So I feel these are the two key areas where depending on your interest, uh, people can grow and even act at the uh, synergy between two and come up with new skill sets that can be useful. So being more flexible and taking care of what is happening in the market is very important when you're trying to upscale. Absolutely. Thank you. And that's the note to all the entrepreneurs and students who are on the panel today as well. Uh, let me ask one final question from my side. Uh, we have uh, people from India uh, on the panel. We have uh, leaders from the company uh, in Singapore who are also looking at India. What would be some of the areas where there are opportunities of potential collaboration between India and Singapore. Now, we discussed India as being a huge market and a huge base for STEM talent and where uh, robotics adoption still has some way to go, but it presents a huge opportunity. Singapore uh, is one of the most uh, dense locations for robots per 10,000 people, uh, a higher level of adoption. Let me start with uh, perhaps Rohit. No, you're looking at Infineon in Singapore. You're also on the board of Infineon in India. How do you see potential collaboration areas between India and Singapore? Yeah, so I think, um, first of all, I think if I look at the, uh, the technical side, right, I'll address both technical and non-technical. So Akanksha laid out uh, some very um, interesting and important uh, you know, job skills, uh, which I think people could look at. Now, Singapore has... Uh, gone through the change curve, right, uh, in terms of adoption, at least on the industrial robotics side. Uh, and that, I think, could be a very nice sharing, uh, which they could do um, with uh, people potentially setting up those kind of systems in India. Um, now, I think that is insofar as, you know, uh, you know, how do you sort of do the layout? How do you sort of uh, map out the processes and then how do you sort of automate them and so on uh, more technical aspects but I think what we always underestimate is how uh, thoughtfully uh, Singapore does change management uh, of the workforce right because a lot of these changes when they're implemented especially in large-scale manufacturing setups people's job profiles change uh, you know new skills get embedded into their job profile there's a, there's, a, there's a period in which they have to upskill themselves and so on. And I think this is where Singapore has done extremely well in terms of uh, keeping that momentum of change going and at the same time managing, uh, you know, the emotions and sort of uh, making sure that everything uh, remains productive, right? And, and I think this is a skill which, is, which will also be needed as large-scale changes occur, 
in people's job profiles and so on in India. And I think that's also some place where Singapore could offer uh, valuable insights. Janish, I think you're on mute. Oops, I'm so sorry. Um, yep. I, I want to pick up a question from the, uh, the Q&A uh, panel that we have here. And this kind of references uh, what Prof was saying. Uh, it's not just about the manufacturing sector. And India is interesting. India has uh, a very large number of the workforce, labor force, that is working in agriculture. And the question is, how do you see robotics technologies impacting the agriculture sector in India? May it meet, it's not just India, I'm sure it's applicable to Singapore as well, but let's start with India, Prof. You're on mute right now. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Actually, I was uh, uh, producing a document on robotics and automation and agriculture. So that took me to reach out to many users, farmers from Chennai, Tanjavur, to Patna, and various places. So I found that there are many innovative agriculturists have entered into India's, India's uh, economy and they are looking for robots that can improve their skill set, that can improve their productivity yield. And, uh, and they vary you know, from not only from harvesting, precision agriculture, so I see India and Singapore can really jointly collaborate on developing cobot for agricultural use. Each individual, just like you know, tractors came in and they really revolutionized the way the agriculture was seen in India nowadays. Similarly, we need to look at, can we bring it you know, simple thing you said that packaging. I visited one uh, floral uh, business uh, company near Hosur. They have a problem on proper packaging of these rose flowers. They are importing, uh, exporting to Australia and other places. And they said, can you build a robot uh, for proper packaging? So like that, there are varieties of uh, uh, opportunities are there in uh, uh, in the in the in the in Indian sector, Indian agricultural sector, from harvesting to packaging to food processing, and we, here we need to build not those caged robots but collaborative robots. And the interesting aspect is that nowadays we can teach on a fly robot what he has to do. You you know we don't have to write a program complete program for a robot to do something. Suppose a packaging has to be altered a little bit. So that new idea, we can develop, you know, nowadays this framework, which is imitation learning, the software is there, there is a framework and a human being demonstrates to robot. And that demonstration is automatically getting coded into the robot. So a person can directly program, an unskilled person, he doesn't know the language, through demonstration, he can enter into the code of robot. So such kind of collaborative robot is necessary. And that's where India and uh, uh, Singapore, they can have a great collaboration. Absolutely. Singapore also, the first part of the question where you talked about agriculture, it is a big, uh, important focus for Singapore as well. Uh, Singapore imports more than 90% of all the food that is consumed in Singapore. So they are also doing a lot of activities around urban farming, very high density farming, multi-level farming, etc. And I see a huge opportunity for collaboration between Singapore. Singapore, not just as a country, but also as a hub for ASEAN, which is also a very large population base. And also with India, we see a lot of companies do a lot more activities now in India. Um, thank you. Thank you to everyone for sharing your perspectives. It's been a very nice discussion. We discussed a lot of areas, manufacturing, service, healthcare, agriculture, India, Singapore. Uh, I've learned a lot from the session. Thank you so much for contributing your time. Let me now pa pass this back to SG Innovate for closing remarks because I just realized we have gone over time. I'm so sorry for that. You're on mute. 
<laughs> this is a very bad um, uh, habit. Uh, everyone seems to forget the, the mic from time to time. So I would just like to take this chance to thank all of our speakers, uh, Prof. Lashmida, uh, Akansha, Ajay, Rohit, and also Janesh for a wonderful time uh, in moderating today's session. And also uh, Dilip in joining us in opening se se the session today. So it's a pity that uh, we have overrun by just slightly little bit and we weren't able to answer everyone's question. But I think today's discussion has been wonderful. Uh, we have learned a lot about the, the current innovations in a, in a region between uh, Singapore and India. And we have a good more than 100 attendees who has joined us until now. So thank you everyone once again and thank you the attendees for keeping with us. Um, we will be sending a post-event email uh, with the link to the YouTube recording in our YouTube channel. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for, for that email and also if there's any any um, questions or you'd like to reach out to any of the speakers for collaboration opportunities, do write to us at events at sgnovi.com as well. So with that, uh, for the last time, I'd like to thank all our speakers and everyone, thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you and bye. Thank you, thank you, bye. Thank you.